is Tara Abier, and I'm the Assistant Director at the Oklahoma Center for Humanities at the University of Tulsa. The poem that I've chosen to read today to celebrate National Poetry Month is entitled Patterns by American writer Amy Lowell, and it was published in 1915. I've always loved this poem because it is a poem that sort of defies expectations. So you'll notice when I begin reading the poem that it seems like a sort of straightforward or stereotypical romantic poem about springtime or about a lover who is far away. The narrator is a woman who is wandering through a beautiful garden in an elaborate gown. And it very much does start out as a kind of flowery romantic poem. However, you soon come to realize that it's something very different, and the end is actually quite tragic and quite sad. And I think that is one of the reasons it's such a powerful poem. Another thing that this poem does that I love is that it also provides a critique or an analysis of gender norms and of social norms both for men and for women, it seems to ask the question, what good are these norms if all they cause is pain and suffering? So it is a poem both about living and about dying, about love and about loss, about norms and restrictions, and the sort of very innate human desire for freedom freedom to be oneself, freedom to love, freedom to live. So I hope you really enjoy this. And if you do, I encourage you to check out some more of Amy Lowell's writing. She is one of my favorites, and I think you'll really enjoy her work. So here goes, Patterns by Amy Lowell. I walk down the garden paths, and all the daffodils are blowing, and the bright blue squills. I walk down the patterned garden paths in my stiff brocaded gown. With my powdered hair and jeweled fan, I too am a rare pattern as I wander down the garden paths. My dress is richly figured and the train makes a pink and silver stain on the gravel and the thrift of the borders just a plate of current fashion, tripping by in high-heeled, ribboned shoes. Not a softness anywhere about me, only whalebone and brocade. And I sink on a seat in the shade of a lime tree, for my passion wars against the stiff brocade. The daffodils and squills flutter in the breeze as they please, and I weep, for the lime tree is in blossom and one small flower has dropped upon my bosom. And the splashing of water drops in the marble fountain comes down the garden paths. The dripping never stops. Underneath my stiffened gown is the softness of a woman bathing in a marble basin. A basin in the midst of hedges grown so thick she cannot see her lover hiding. But she guesses he is near and the sliding of the water seems the stroking of a dear hand upon her. What is summer in a fine brocaded gown? I should like to see it lying in a heap upon the ground, all the pink and silver crumpled up on the ground. I would be the pink and silver as I ran along the paths, and he would stumble after, bewildered by my laughter. I should see the sun flashing from his sword hilt and the buckles on his shoes. I would choose to lead him in a maze along the patterned paths, a bright and laughing maze for my heavy booted lover, till he caught me in the shade and the buttons of his waistcoat bruised my body as he clasped me, aching, melting, unafraid. With the shadows of the leaves, and the sun drops and the plopping of the water drops all about us in the open afternoon. I am very like to swoon with the weight of this brocade. 
for the sun sifts through the shade. Underneath the fallen blossom in my bosom is a letter I have hid. It was brought to me this morning by a writer from the Duke. Madam, we regret to inform you that Lord Hartwell died in action Thursday and night. As I read it in the white morning light, the letters squirm like snakes. Any answer, madam, said my footman. No, I told him. See that the messenger takes some refreshment. No, no answer. And I walked into the garden, up and down the patterned paths in my stiff, correct brocade. The blue and yellow flowers stood up proudly in the sun, each one. I stood upright too, held rigid to the pattern by the stiffness of my gown. Up and down I walked, up and down. In a month, he would have been my husband. In a month, here, underneath this lime, we would have broken the pattern. He for me and I for him. He is Colonel, I as Lady on this shady seat. He had a whim that sunlight carried blessing, and I answered, it shall be as you have said. Now he is dead. In summer and in winter, I shall walk up and down the patterned garden paths in my stiff brocaded gown. The squills and daffodils will give place to pillared roses and to asters and to snow. I shall go up and down in my gown, gorgeously arrayed, boned, and stayed, and the softness of my body will be guarded from embrace by each button, hook, and lace. For the man who should loose me is dead, fighting with the Duke in Flanders, in a pattern called war. Christ our patterns for. Thank you. Thank you for celebrating the National Poetry Month with us. My name is Helen Zhang. I'm the Wellspring Associate Professor of Chinese and Comparative Literature. Today, I'm sharing a poem by Mu Dan, a 20th century poet who, through poetry, not only revitalized the modern Chinese language, but also testified to modern China's history. His poem, Upon Turning Thirty, was written in 1947. 1947 was a critical moment at multiple levels. At the individual level, Mu Dan turned 30 in 1947. According to Confucius, at 30, an individual attains maturity and takes a stand. Mudan's poem, however, challenges the notion of a smooth transition and reveals on the one hand the loss of youth and innocence, and on the other hand, the potential for spiritual rebirth through physical destruction. At the national level, 1947 marked a turning point in modern China's history. Hardly had the Chinese people finished celebrating the end of World War II when the Civil War began anew. 1947, therefore, was a year plagued by war. Wudan's poem reflects upon modern China's fate and demonstrates the resilience of a people. Shan 当太洁白的死亡
主人。然而篆刻就是诱惑，从无到有，一个没有年岁的人占入青春的影子，重新发现自己，在毁灭的火焰之中。时而剧烈，时而缓和，向着微尘里流注。时间，他吝啬又嫉妒，创造时而毁灭，接连的承受他的任性，于是就落幕。在过去和未来两大黑暗间，以不断熄灭的现在，举起了泥土、思想和荣耀。你和我和这可憎的一切的分野，而在每一刻的崩溃上，看见一个敌视的我，枉然的挚爱和守卫，只有跟着向下碎，没有钢铁和巨石不在他的手里，化为仙粉，留恋他。像长长的记忆，拒绝我们。像冰，是时间的旅程。和他肩并肩的粘在一起，一个沉默的同伴，反正我们句句温馨的。I'm Stephen Buckley. I will be reading Upon Turning Thirty by Mu Dan, translated in English by Helen Zhang. Obeying orders from the void on high, passed down through the chain of command, merely a fledgling scout venturing into the vast enemy, who must, with both hands, embrace and receive incessant harm. How fast the threshold of dawn's innocence is crossed! A cold, clear ray about to ignite and blaze, a death too pale and too pure, longing to dive into color and be born anew. A willingness that is unwilling, a certainty that is uncertain, attacking and attacking again, merely fermenting the final betrayal. Triumph and glory forever belong to the invisible master. Yet. A fleeting moment is a lure from non-being into being. An unaged man steps into youth's shadow, rediscovering himself within destruction's flames. Now vehement, now gentle, flowing into this atomic dust, time, miserly and jealous, now creates, now destroys, through continuously bearing its caprice. I come into being. Between past and future, one darkness and another, using the incessantly extinguished present, I raise earth, thought, and glory. You and me and the dike that holds back all that is detestable. Yet, upon every moment's collapse, I see a me staring back hostily, loving and guarding in vain, having no choice but to follow the shattering fall. No iron, steel, or rock can resist conversion into grit by its hand. Our fondness of it, like long reminiscence, its rejection of us, like ice. So travels time. Shoulder to shoulder, we cleave to it, a silent companion who, line by line, disproves our warm whispers. Upon turning thirty, by Mudan, translated into English by Helen Zhang. Moved on, upon turning thirty. Obeying orders from the void on high, passed down through the chain of command. Merely a fledgling scout, venturing into the vast enemy, who must, with both hands, embrace and receive incessant harm. How fast the threshold of dawn's innocence is crossed—a cold, clear ray.
about to ignite and blaze, a death too pale and too pure, longing to dive into color and be born anew. A willingness that is unwilling, a certainty that is uncertain, attacking and attacking again, merely fermenting the final betrayal. Triumph and glory forever belong to the invisible master. Yet a fleeting moment is a lure from non-being to being. An unaged man steps into youth's shadow, rediscovering himself within destruction's flames. Now vehement, now gentle, flowing into this atomic dust, time, miserly and jealous, now creates, now destroys, through continuously bearing its caprice, I come into being. Between past and future, one darkness and another, using the incessantly extinguished present, I raise earth, thought, and glory. You and me and the dike that holds back all that is detestable. Yet upon every moment's collapse, I see a me staring back hostilely, loving and guarding in vain, having no choice but to follow the shattering fall. No iron, steel, or rock can resist conversion into grit by its hand. Our fondness of it, like long reminiscence, its rejection of us like ice, so travels time. Shoulder to shoulder, we cleave to it, a silent companion, who line by line disproves or warns. Mu Dawn, upon turning 30. Hello, I'm Brennan Vanderbeen. I will be reading Upon Turning 30 by Mu Dawn, translated by Helen Zhang. Upon Turning 30. Obeying orders from the void on high, passed down through the chain of command, merely a fledgling scout venturing into the vast enemy who must with both hands embrace and receive incessant harm. How fast the threshold of Dawn's innocence is crossed, a cold, clear ray about to ignite and blaze, a death too pale and too pure, longing to dive into color and be born anew, a willingness that is unwilling, a certainty that is uncertain, attacking and attacking again, merely fermenting the final betrayal. Triumph and glory forever belong to the invisible master. Yet a fleeting moment is a lure from non-being to being. An unaged man steps into youth's shadow, rediscovering himself within destruction's flames. Now vehement, now gentle, Flowing into this atomic dust, time, miserly and jealous, now creates, now destroys. Through continuously bearing its caprice, I come into being. Between past and future, one darkness and another, using the incessantly extinguished present, I raise earth, thought, and glory. You and me, and the dike that holds back all that is detestable. Yet, upon every moment's collapse, I see a me staring back hostily, 
loving and guarding in vain, having no choice but to follow the shattering fall. No iron, steel, or rock can resist conversion into grit by its hand. Our fondness of it, like long reminiscence, its rejection of us, like ice. So travels time. Shoulder to shoulder we cleave to it, a silent companion who, line by line, disproves our warm whispers. Upon Turning Thirty by Mu Don. Translated by Helen Zhang. Hi, my name is Walker Womack, and I'm going to be reciting Mu Don's Upon Turning Thirty, translated by Dr. Helen Zhang. Obeying orders from the void on high, passed down through the chain of command, merely a fledgling scout, venturing into the vast enemy, who must with both hands embrace and receive incessant harm. How fast the threshold of dawn's innocence is crossed, a cold, clear ray about to ignite blaze a death too pale and too pure longing to dive into color and be born anew a willingness that is unwilling a certainty that is uncertain attacking and attacking again merely fermenting the final betrayal triumph and glory forever belong to the invisible master. Yet, a fleeting moment is a lure from non-being to being. An unaged man steps into youth's shadow, rediscovering himself within destruction's flames. Now vehement, now gentle, flowing into this atomic dust, time, miserly and jealous, now creates, now destroys, through continuously bearing its caprice, I come into being. Between past and future, one darkness and another, using the incessantly extinguished present, I raise earth, thought, and glory, you and me, and the dyke that holds back all that is detestable. Yet, upon every moment's collapse, I see a me staring back hostily, loving and guarding in vain, having no choice but to follow the shattering fall. No iron, or steel, or rock can resist conversion into grit by its hand. Our fondness of it, like long reminiscence, its rejection of us, like ice, so moves time. Shoulder to shoulder we cleave to it, a silent companion who, line by line, disproves our warm whispers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruce Dean Willis. I'm a professor of Spanish and comparative literature at the University of Tulsa. And this is my contribution to the National Poetry Month uh, event, series of readings sponsored by the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities here at the University of Tulsa. The poem that I would like to read is a sonnet. It's written by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, Sister Juana Inés of the Cross. She was a nun in 17th century Mexico City, what was at the time known as New Spain. She's hands down one of the best writers in Spanish. She's 
hands down one of the most important writers and thinkers of the 17th century. And just a wonder and a pleasure to read. She was a genius. She's wonder, a wonder and a pleasure to teach as well. Um, she was born without many uh, resources, but managed to ingratiate herself into the vice regal court in Mexico City and enjoy protection from two different viceroy administrations. She sought a life in the convent for many reasons. Most people think that it was perhaps uh, mostly because she knew that she would be able to uh, live a more vigorous intellectual life in that way, and she had a large collection of books and musical instruments and scientific instruments. She wrote religious poetry, but most of the poetry that she wrote was not religious. And this sonnet is not a religious one. It is a love sonnet. It's known by its first verse, Esta tarde mi bien cuando te hablaba. So this is Sor Juana in her sonnet, usually called Sonnet 14, I think. I will recite it in Spanish and read an English translation. Esta tarde mi bien cuando te hablaba, como en tu rostro y tus acciones vía, que con palabras no te persuadía, que el corazón me vieses deseaba. Y amor, que mis intentos ayudaba, venció lo que imposible parecía, pues entre el llanto que el dolor vertía, el corazón deshecho destilaba. Baste ya de rigores, mi bien, baste, no te atormenten más, celos tiranos, ni el vil recelo tu quietud contraste con sombras necias, con indicios vanos, pues ya en líquido amor viste y tocaste mi corazón deshecho entre tus manos. Here is an English translation by Alex Ingber. This afternoon, my love, while we were talking, and in your face and acts, I clearly saw that with my words I never would convince you. I wished my heart could overcome your doubts. And love, who all my efforts was assisting, achieved what so impossible had seen. For in my tears, which in my grief were spilling, a heart unloosed, dissolved, came trickling out. Enough, my love, of cruelty, enough. Let brutal jealousy no more torment you, nor let low fears your mind's peace countermand with foolish fantasies, with empty signs. For in liquid form you've seen and touched my heart unloosed, dissolved, between your hands. There's so much to say about Sor Juana and so much that could be said about this wonderful poem. <coughs> um, one of the reasons that I really appreciate this poem is that she took the idea of a love poem and made it into a chemistry experiment or some kind of an alchemical transformation where what's happening is that the proof of love as if it were a scientific proof, is shown through the distillation, almost like putting something in a flask and you know, having a tube where a, a liquid evaporates and then comes down the tube and comes out the other side, and the liquid that comes out the other side are the tears. Uh, she doesn't use the word tears, but she uses the word llanto, which means crying. And so it's as if to say that the, the tears are in fact her heart, her heart undone and loosed, as this English translation says. And um, it's, it's a wonderful conceit or, you know, uh, a, a poetic uh, device in this poem to communicate the idea of a proof of love. Um, the way that, just say really quickly, the way that a sonnet works in Spanish, because also every language has its own um, approach to a sonnet, but there are 11 verses in each, excuse me, 11 syllables per verse and 14 verses, and Spanish is a much more polysyllabic language than English. So for example, the word corazón has three syllables, heart in English only has one. To make words fit, you have to think about them differently a bit in Spanish. And um, the fact that she uses the word corazón three times in this poem is very telling. And of course she uses it in very prominent positions in the fourth verse, which is the end of the first quatrain, the eighth verse end of the second quatrain and then in the final verse. Um, it's, it's a very effective poem. It's, it's a, um, as I say, a wonder to teach and recite. And Sor Juana died 325 years ago this month. It was April 17th, 1695. She died, the victim, one of many victims, of course, of a plague that was uh, affecting the Mexico City area at that time. 
and so it's um, it's just telling and appropriate to remember uh, Sor Juana and all of her work. I hope you've enjoyed this sonnet, uh, Esta tarde ni bien cuando te hablaba by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz from the 17th century. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Jeff Druin in the English department at the University of Tulsa, and I'd like to read In a Station of the Metro from 1913 by Ezra Pound. As I thought about a poem to select for this series, In a Station kept coming back to me because it's a short haiku-like piece about a subway station in Paris, about a public space and the various kinds of connection that are denied to us right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So here it is. In a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow. One element that makes this poem so curious is the whiplash we experience while careening from the crowded underground subway to a tranquil, remote nature scene. It's as if the poem is giving us two very different pictures and asking us to make sense of them. For a bit of context, the poem is a quintessential example of the imagist movement, which sought to perform in language the simultaneity that pictures are able to achieve. It juxtaposes two dissimilar things in order to elicit some common structure or a meaningful pattern. What connects them is the thread between the faces and the blossoms. This 1907 painting, Wu de la Pays by Jean Berraud, shows clusters of people walking, talking, holding hands, linking arms, and cavorting in a public space, right? All the things that we're not allowed to do right now. It's as if they're in motion, like the painting could suddenly transform into a movie scene. This is pretty close to how a Parisian crowd would have appeared to Pound when he visited in 1912 um, and was inspired to write the poem. So the gathering, the life, the motion are all part of a larger process that's unfolding in real time. Now that's a key element also of haiku poetry um, that suggests the other source of inspiration for this poem, a Japanese print that he also encountered in 1912. This 18th century print by Suzuki Harunobu is titled Woman Admiring Plum Blossoms at Night, and it depicts a blooming branch whose petal clusters struck pound as being similar to the faces in the Parisian crowd. So the two images are dissimilar in a few ways uh, that nonetheless elicit a common connection. Among the contrasting elements are city and nature, noise and tranquility, people and flowers, underground and overhead, darkness and light, rapid transit and slow transformation, east and west, past and present. But what's common is the clustering pattern a cluster typically being a kind of a semi-chaotic agglomeration of individuals. So both the Parisian crowd and the Japanese plum blossoms are alive with the same frenetic warmth of life, yet connected by its mysterious branch, right? A linear structure that holds them in physical proximity, yet contrastingly participates in the cycle of blooming, death, and rebirth. In other words, it's a poem that depicts and embodies a wholeness, right, in which we are all continuously participating. So a few years ago, the New York Times ran a bio piece on the man who voiced the station announcements that are played in New York City subway cars. Uh, his name is Ber Bernie Wagonblast, um, although he's recently been replaced by Aquafina, who is also amazing. Um, by reader request, Mr. Wagonblast recorded in a station of the Metro, um, which I'll play for you now. In a station of the Metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. All right, so um, the, that spacious emptiness, right, of the reverb, reminds me of the emptiness of public space in New York and indeed everywhere right now. It's a ghost town, right? Um, so Pound's poem reminds us that the apparition of those faces in the crowd will bloom again once the virus completes its life cycle and we regain the warmth, the physical touch, 
um, of life, which we are all continuously participating in, right? Especially during the current season of spring rebirth. So that's what I've got. Um, perhaps you've got some thoughts to add. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.